my record will come and go. But the 50 year journey that I was on to get there, no one can ever take that away from me. And that's what transformed my life. Welcome to the Built to Last podcast, a community for coaches founded on the principles encourage, equip, and empower. We are performance coaches working for eternal purpose. Now, here are your co hosts, Charlie Ray and Justin Ventavania. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Built to Last. Here we are all about performance coaching with eternal purpose. And what that means is, yes, we love strength and conditioning. Yes, we love all things human performance. But what we love more than that is learning about the God who created us and talking about him and seeing how he's interwoven into all these passions that we have in our life, whether it be our family, our career, all these things, God can be found in it. And when we use those things to glorify him, he teaches us some phenomenal things. And what we did today is we talked to coach Bill Gillespie, who has been coaching in this profession for over 30 years. And if that name doesn't ring a bell, on January 22nd of 2022, coach Bill Gillespie set the all-time world record for the bench press. He benched 1,129.8 pounds at the age of 62, guys at the age of 62. And so it's an incredible story. And what I love about it is that he spent the majority of the time talking to us about the journey leading up to it and everything he learned along the way. And so you guys are going to take a lot out of this one. What I wanted to do, guys, is I wanted to be quiet. Whenever I have somebody at that point in their career talking to me uh, and sharing their wisdom, I don't want to talk much. And so what I did was I just let coach go. And I think that you guys are going to find that um, there's not enough pages in your notebook to take notes on this one because there's so much. And so if you're, if you're not familiar with Coach Gillespie and his background, I just want to give you guys his bio real quick. Coach Gillespie was a four-time All-American and two-time small college national champion at Liberty University in the shot put. From there, Coach found out that there was an opportunity to make a career in strength and conditioning. And so from being a student athlete, he got right into it as an assistant strength and conditioning coach at Liberty um, from 1983 to 1991. From there, Coach Gillespie transferred to the University of Washington, where he spent 11 seasons there. And from there, he moved into the NFL, where he was working with the Seattle Seahawks for two years. Coach goes into it in the episode that he had no plans to leave the NFL, and he loved his job. They were working towards a Super Bowl run. And then he got a call from his mentor back at Liberty asking him to come back. And after a lot of prayer and deliberation, coach decided to go back to Liberty from 2005 to 2019, where he worked with the football program, did some incredible things there. And now he is currently a Sorenex strength coach uh, with Sorenex, where his primary role is to support our community with the knowledge and education he's gained throughout his career. You guys are going to take so much from this one. I don't want to hold you back any longer. Enjoy. So, Coach, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I appreciate you spending time with us. Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate you having me. I've been looking forward to, uh, to, to doing this. Absolutely. Um, so, Coach, you know, I've been thinking, and I hear it a lot that people share with me on a daily basis almost, that they say something like, oh, I'm, I'm getting older. I don't have it like I used to. And I was thinking, anytime I hear that from now on, I'm just going to pull up a video of Bill Gillespie at age 62, benching 1129.8, and that conversation will be closed. So, um, so congratulations. Thank you. I remember when I was 27 and I thought, man, I'm getting old. I mean, I feel so beat up and wore out. I'm getting old. And I realized I wasn't old. I was at the probably peak of my life. And I said, I'll never say that again, ever. <laughs> No, that's awesome. Um, Well, coach, I know you've been pretty open about your training journey. I've listened to a bunch of podcasts with you on it, and you've talked a lot about how you've almost experimented on yourself as a lifter and tried all different things out. And one of the first questions I wanted to ask you is, you know, what what was it like experimenting on yourself um, throughout your training journey? You know, I had a mentor, Dave Williams, who uh, taught me how to be a strength coach. And this man uh, took experimenting on himself to the whole another level uh every day it was sort of like what contraption did he come up with today you know uh what exercise he was doing triphasic training back in the 80s okay which is supposedly brand new uh he was at least 15 20 maybe 30 years 
ahead of everybody else. But he was always experimenting on himself. And it taught me, of course, hey, there's nothing wrong with experimenting. Figure out what to do and why you're going to do it. Because what people do so many times, particularly strength coaches, they play it safe and they're going to do what everybody else does. Or worse yet, they decide that who is the strongest guy out there, okay? I'm going to do what he does. Well, that guy might be 5'6", 320 plus pounds and have a range of motion of six inches. Why would you follow him, all right? Right, right. Uh, you know, uh, for myself, I, I like to study the women on the bench press because one, they're not built to bench press. Two, their testosterone level's about a little closer to mine than a 20 year old and so if by studying them and like jennifer thompson and studying her and and what she did for her training i was able to go and say hey here's some here's some things that i can do to make myself better and i kept cutting out the fat that's what recently over the last three years has made such a big difference in my bench press is i just kept cutting out the fat i kept i realized that the bench press is a very energy sensitive uh, exercise and by eliminating uh, movements that were wasted energy I my bench press started taking off and it, it not only mine but um, about 20 other guys that I help out on the bench press too uh, they're all their lifts kept going up but it, I wanted to have an understanding of why it worked and when it works you know some people say well that works for some people no you know what most things work for everybody but it works at a particular time not necessarily um just all the time you know and so we we got to constantly experiment understand and you know we we didn't have the internet back in the day you know so we didn't have uh access to all that information and most of the guys that were writing articles were lying about what they were doing. So I didn't trust, you know, I, I found out real fast that they were lying that they told me. And so you, you had to go and uh, you had to go and experiment and find out what worked. And then on top of that, uh, everybody wanted to know what the guys on drugs were doing. Well, that didn't pertain to me, you know, and I wanted to know what was the difference? How did I have to just, adjust my training program and the best way to learn was get in there and do it myself you know and and, and understand that you know you're going to have some bad days you know but that's how you learn is constantly experimenting document record it and uh it's amazing how you, when you look back on your journals the things you can learn through um uh, through pushing yourself to um to find new ideas and that's exactly what I was thinking, coach, as you were talking. I mean, I have all my old training logs from years and years ago of when I'm close to when I first started lifting and to just see the numbers I was hitting, little notes I made on certain things. I'm still pulling from that and using that 10 years later. Um, yeah. And I'm sure for you over your career, you have tons of notes like that. And I'm sure you've learned a lot of lessons along the way to reach an all time world record um, at 1129.8. I mean, what, what were some of the biggest lessons that you learned along the way? Um, don't tell God what you're good at. Mm. All right. I, I came, I did in the ninth grade, I did 600 push ups a day. Um, I've been bench pressing since I was 14 years old and, uh, came out of college as an all American shot putter, went to the first drug free nationals and benched 341 pounds and didn't have a bad day. I, I just sucked at the bench, you know, um, I worked hard at it. I just wasn't very good at it. I wasn't a natural. Uh, I put in, um, uh, about 10 to 12 more years and my bench was stuck around 440. you know, it's still not very good. Um, and it was when I got to the chance to sit down with a former Soviet union weightlifting coach. And we were taught how to design programs. And it was during this time that I decided I was going to reinvent how to train the bench press. And I was going to pretend like I hadn't been told anything. Wow. That I wasn't going to have just go from scratch. 
and I was going to reinvent how to train the bench press. And I remember sitting there just going, okay, what are the facts? Let's start with the facts. What works? What doesn't work? And I started designing a program off of that. And right after that, man, my bench started jumping uh, 50, 60, 70 pounds a year. And people were just like, what's going on, you know? But it was the fact that I was understanding uh, program design to maximize my uh, bench press. And that's when it started to take off. Um, you know, uh, the other thing I learned was, was that 300 pounds is 300 pounds today. It's 300 pounds tomorrow. If 300 pounds beats me, then, and I got to go home and I got to look myself in the mirror and I go, okay, what's got to change? Something's got to change. And it's not the 300 pounds. Mm -hmm. It's me. I right. got to change. That's good. And so what I had to do is I had to go and reevaluate my life, uh, lifestyle, uh, commitment, my training program. All these things had to come into play so that I could come back two, three weeks later and beat that 300 pounds. Now, the cool thing about this is this. The Bible says that bodily exercise profiteth little. I absolutely agree. If you just are going for the physical aspect, but when you understand what is the consistent variable in this situation, it's not me, it's Christ, all right? I'm, again, once again, I'm the inconsistent variable. So when I live an inconsistent life, I'm the one that's got to look myself in the mirror and go, what do I got to do to be more like Christ? What has to change in my life? And so I've, I've used this lifting to help myself to understand my walk with Christ, to understand uh, how I can become more consistent. That's phenomenal, Coach. And, and it sounds like, as I'm hearing you speak, you're talking a lot about ownership, and it seems like you've heart postured yourself where you've been so humble to say, hey, maybe I've programmed the bench press a certain way for X amount of years. Well, I'm going to be humble enough to say, well, let me try and do it from a blank slate. Let me try something new. Let me take it uh, as if I didn't know anything and build it from the ground up. And I think that's a really wise lesson for us to learn in any area of life. Like you said, lifting is going to teach us about more than just the weights. And yep. it's really cool to hear how you responded from that. And another thing that I heard you speak about um, previously is how I think you mentioned missing 20 attempts in a row in competition. And I was thinking to myself, as I heard you talk about that, I'm like, man, that has got to be rough. Don't, I think about like a, a baseball player, right? When they say he gets the yips or when he just can't make connect with the ball or whatever it is. And that's tough for people, right? The mental battle is one of the hardest battles to fight in this life. And so I was curious, what was your mindset like through that process, going through it and coming out of it? I had, okay, I, I've been battling a uh, restless leg. And it's not like, oh, I twitch at night, okay? It's all day long. Uh, uh, I look like I had Parkinson's. Uh, uh, my wife and I would purposely bring me, make sure I was at home in the evenings because I could just start shaking uh, at any point in time. I happened all the time. And um, so I had that going on. And of course I, I saw, I ended up seeing seven different doctors. Six of them told me it was, it was me. It was me. It was, uh, they'd go after the low hanging fruit. They tell me I should quit lifting. And I'm like, do you understand that I put in 50 years to get to this point and I got a chance to do something incredible and you're telling me to quit, but you don't know that's the problem. You're just guessing. I'm um, no, I'm not going to, you know? And uh, I had doctors telling me to quit. I had family members telling me to quit, um, you know, because I wasn't sleeping at night. I didn't fall asleep. I absolutely... I would just pass out. I, 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 my sleeping disorder was so bad that if I had to go in another room to use the Theragun to massage my legs and get them to yeah. relax. Yep. And between the other room and getting into my room, I would fall asleep standing up four times easily. Wow. Just, and we had no idea how long I would sleep. I know one time I put ice packs on my legs to get them to relax. I marked the time 45 minutes I later, I woke up with the ice packs on my legs still standing there. 
Um, wow. I was, I was exhausted. Um, how, how this record got set is beyond me. It didn't make no sense whatsoever how I was able to do it. I had been close to it uh, like two, three other times. And I, but I knew that God had called me to, to, to do this. I knew he had, and I knew he hadn't, he hadn't told me to stop. And, uh, but I also knew that I was starting to pay a price. And uh, I told my wife, I said, on January 22nd, this is going to be my last meet. And uh, she didn't believe me, but I said, no, I, I, I swear to you, it's, it's going to be my last meet. Wow. Uh, I explained to her all the reasons why. And she said, well, okay, maybe. And um, I, uh, I, I went into the meet and the night before I, I had, the day before I had visited North Carolina state was with meeting with our strength coaches. I'm driving to the meet. It's freezing rain, dark. And somebody did not secure a ladder, came out of their car. I hit it, blew out the front tire. Oh, man. And I spent three and a half hours changing that tire. Oh, uh, man. Oh, I had 800 pounds of weights in the back of that truck. Um, I, couldn't, I couldn't just, you know, ream on the, the tire. Uh, I had to put the jack in a place where it wasn't supposed to be. Unbelievable. Um, wow. Yeah. And then, then the tire was seized to the rim. I could, I couldn't, I couldn't get it off. And, uh, I was, I was just like begging God, please help me. What's going on? This is horrible. It's freezing cold. The only light I had was from my phone. Uh, I couldn't see anything. What was funny though was, is I bought the tire. They're brand new tires from Sam's and I got, I got, took the tire back and the guy says, sir, you did look on the envelope. It said, free roadside assistance oh, i said no boy. no i i did not see that and i said i wish i had oh <laughs> it man have, it, it would have been great to know that <laughs> uh <laughs> but i mean i could i got done i couldn't even move my arms man and i'm thinking to myself benching 1100 pounds tomorrow there's no way but you know i think that god has to put us in a situation where you know i was i'm old um i i was I, i've had that tired situation i i've been sick really really sick uh two weeks earlier with a sinus infection where my eyes were completely bloodshot red and i had stuff just pouring out of my face i didn't have one good workout coming into it um and there was no physical reason why I should have been able to do it. I was I was strong, but I was I I, I didn't have a good workout going into into the thing. But I think God sometimes has to get us to the point where He's like, "All right, now I can receive the credit because there's no way in this world that it makes any sense to anybody whatsoever that this is going to happen." And wow. and. And, uh, you know, being 62, come on, that don't make no sense. You know, uh, I, I look at friends of mine who are passing away, including my younger brother passed away three years ago. And I'm thinking, I'm lucky to be alive. And here I am, had the mountaintop experience of being the number one bench presser in the world of all time. I mean, that's humbling, you know, because... It doesn't make sense, but it's, you know, it comes back to that where God called me to bench press. And I said, God, please let me do something else. I want, how about baseball? How about football? How about track and field? How about Olympic lifting? I love the Olympic lifting. Uh, no, the bench press, but God, I suck at the bench press. No, just stay with it. <laughs> and I go, come on, God. So I have no, nobody respects the bench press, you know, um, you know, uh, funny stories. I was uh, coaching with the Seahawks and our nose guard had been in, uh, injured and he was in a wheelchair 
And Sean Alexander comes up to me and says, Coach, we need you to play this Sunday. And I said, Sean, stop making fun of me. I'm 42 years old. I'm too old. He goes, no, no, no. Coach, seriously, Jerry Rice was on the team. Jerry's 41. And, Coach, you bench 800 pounds. All you got to do is grab two guys and hold on. I said, for how many plays? They said three or four. And I said, in a row? And I'm like, there's no way. I said, there's a, there, I can't, no way. And he goes, we're going to go talk to Coach Holgram. Well, Coach Holgram never asked me to play. So <laughs> <laughs> either you need a bench more than 800, which I know none of the other players could do, or the bench press isn't the most important exercise in the world to uh, play football. But you know what? Sometimes, Coach, like some of my favorite comments or compliments are the ones that have come from the athletes. So that I'm sure that meant a lot when two NFL football players told you to suit up with them. Yeah, it did mean a lot, you know, especially someone of Sean's caliber, you know. Oh, yeah. He, he, he set the NFL record that year and for touchdowns and set that it was MVP the following year. And so. He, he's got a heart of gold, man. Uh, and, I think um, he's but, a believer too, right? I've seen him be pretty oh, public about his faith. Oh, yes. Uh, the Seahawks, the Seahawks had so many believers uh, that honestly, I'm not bashing Liberty, but to, to, when I went to Liberty, I took a step down in my spiritual environment because the Seahawks were so, wow, it was for real. You know, there were so many strong christian men on that team wow. between the coaches and the players yes yeah. wow even i remember when they, when they made that run to the super bowl um i think it might was that the year after you left i think you were saying yeah yeah crazy I, you mean when i lost two hundred fifteen thousand dollars in bonus money yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, essentially and, and, and i experienced my only losing season in my coaching career yeah oh that was, my gosh that was the year. yeah yeah wow yeah. That was the year. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah, I, I remember, though, even through throughout just following along with some of the things um, with the Seahawks organization, they've even put some stuff out in the media of the team um, doing things with, like, Bible studies and having a bunch of guys speak on their faith. I've seen a lot of stuff from the Seahawks, like I said, especially when they went to the Super Bowl, um, yep. about putting stuff out about their faith. It was real. It was real to them. It was uh, Jim Zorn, the quarterback coach, was he was for real, man. He, and and I watched him walk the uh, walk the talk and and he, he was for there was just so many guys and wow. if you didn't if, you know uh, Trent Dilfer and Matt Hasselbeck great Christian men they ran what was called the Daily Bread Club and wow. um, they had a, a at by nine o'clock you had to be able to they could ask you some question relating to the story of the Daily Bread. If you couldn't answer, you had to put a dollar in that box. And, uh, <laughs> oh, that's good. Yeah. I remember one of the players walking in with $300, three $100 bills. Oh. and says, puts it in the box and says, don't ask me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. He bought himself about a year right there. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. That's a cool story, Coach. Um, well, hey, one other question I wanted to ask you on in the lifting section is um, – you know, I've, I'm, a, I'm a lifter myself, um, and so I've, I'll take out heavy attempts. And I know just from my own experience, when I'm walking out something that's pretty heavy, right, there's a certain mindset you have to be in. There are times you get the jitters before you take it out, and it, it's a test. And thinking about all the weight you've lifted and all the maximal attempts you've taken, you're no stranger to what that, that feeling is in your gut when you're about to do something that, you know, can be a little scary, a little dangerous, and, but I think it's good for us. And so I was curious, what – what kind of what would you have to say on the mindset of taking heavy attempts, and what does that do for for a man or a woman? All right, the the worst thing you could do is get psyched up. All right, if you have to get psyched up or play the right song, that's so superficial. It's unbelievable. No, you got to you have to go and um, Psalms forty six ten, be still and know that I am God, and if God called you to do it, relax. I know it sounds crazy, but embrace it. You're going to be, it's okay to be afraid, okay? It's okay to feel the jitters, but you're either going to use it or it's going to use you. So you embrace it and you're like, 
it'll allow you to do something incredible through it. Um, I had a test done on my ability to focus and um, they got done and they said, coach, you have no fear at all. <laughs> I'm like, I'm sitting in a room by myself answering yes, no to these questions. What's there to be afraid of? And they said, no, you tested out better than any world-class athlete we've ever tested. I'm like, wow, that's pretty incredible. They said, aren't you the guy that lifts those heavy weights? And I said, yes. And they said, what, what's happened is because you've done this for so many years, you know how to mentally get yourself into that state. You don't have to go and psych up. In fact, they said, I bet you caffeine just really wrecks a ha havoc on you. I said, yeah, it really does. They said, because you, a little caffeine with you goes a long ways and you can take it to a, a place where most people can't go. And so as years go by, you don't, you don't need hardly any caffeine to go through one of these, you know, heavy workout because you already know where you got to go mentally. And it's like that big attempt on that last record attempt. I knew where I had to go and it, it took me a while to get over it, but yeah, <laughs> it, <laughs> for like four weeks, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it, 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 it was pretty, it's people sit there and think that, uh, you know, it's all about the physical development, but there are things occurring in your life that are better, be, bigger and better than just the physical, you know, your ability to focus, your Betty, your ability to handle setbacks, your ability to handle uh, bad days, man. People ask me, have you, have, have you had bad days? I said, shoot, I had a bad decade between the ages of 49 and 59. I just <laughs> thought, it, you know, I thought well, I'm just getting old, but reality was I was working like 60 to 70 hours a week yeah. or more trying yeah. to help the football team get to go to FBS, you know? So you just, you, you, you just have to understand there are going to be bad days, so especially as a, you know, drug-free athlete, you're going to have some bad days. So teaches you a lesson, you know, just like every day and your ability to overcome them, then you're going to take this and hopefully take it to the rest of your life and other aspects of your life and apply it. So it makes you a, you know, a stronger person, a stronger father, a stronger husband, stronger leader. Amen. Amen, coach. That's great advice. There's a lot of lessons learned there on your journey, and we'll get to a couple more of them at the end. But one of the things you mentioned there um, towards the end of your comments was being at Liberty and helping them uh, climb as a program. And one of the things I wanted to ask you what it was like of being a student athlete at Liberty and then working there for a large majority of your career. What was, what was that process like? Um, I loved it. I loved Liberty. Um, I did two tour duties there. Uh, my first, I went there as a student athlete. Um, I, then I stayed in coach. I actually was a, a track coach for a while too. Wow. And then, uh, yeah, yeah. I was the head track coach. It's only been now four head track coaches in the history of the, of the university. Um, and I, I did really well. Uh, so well that uh, University of Georgia heard about my success and asked me if I'd be interested in interviewing to be the track coach. And I went, uh, I went to Dr. Fall and I said, no, you know, Dr. Fall, I really think that strength and conditioning is where I'm my calling. And he goes, okay, you'll start tomorrow. So, <laughs> that worked but, out uh, well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but uh I, uh, I, I loved it there, man. Uh, I felt like I had a purpose. I had a calling, uh, you know, and the second time I came back, I was a little reluctant to want to come back. I was with the uh, Seahawks. I was, I was enjoying the NFL and Dr. Falwell called me in his office and sat me down and said, Bill, I, I, I'm going to ask a big favor of you. And I said, what's that, Dr. Fowler? He goes, I'm going to ask you to walk away from the NFL and come back to Liberty. And I said, whoa. I said, Dr. Fowler, I said, I hope you understand. Liberty is one of the five worst football teams in America right now. 
And I says, we got a shot at the Super Bowl and I don't have to leave. And you're asking a lot. And he goes, I know I am. But he says, let me explain to you why I want you to come back. He said, uh, we have been successful in music, almost every sport, except for football. And he says, when Virginia Tech wanted to raise the academic standards and increase student enrollment, he says, they don't go to the student recruitment office. They go to the football coach. They give the football coach more money and tell them to win games. And then young people will want to come to school there. And he goes, and as they come to school there, then we're going to send out missionaries in all aspects of life, you know, doctors, lawyers, teachers. And we're going to reach the world for Christ. And I need you to help me to reach the world for Christ because I can't get three, four star athletes to come here. We can develop them, but we can't get them here. And uh, I thought to myself, I said, man, uh, to have a bigger calling than just a job sound really cool to me sound because I, I really cared about liberty football i really cared about reaching the world for christ so i walked away from the nfl i walked away from the opportunity to make a lot of money um and i came back and the first year was oh my gosh we you know here i went from playing the packers in the playoffs to going down to Presbyterian, no offense to Presbyterian, or in some other schools, and looking like we were playing in a high school stadium. And I'm like, what? We're riding school buses to go to the games, you know? And I'm just wow. like, what did I get myself into? I went from riding in Paul Allen's personal 747 with first-class seats all the way through the plane with live satellite TV, food that you catered on there like you can't imagine and to getting on a bus with hardly any ac thinking what did i get myself into this is the stupidest decision i ever made and uh then the seahawks ended up going to the super bowl we went one in ten my only losing season in my career and i thought i i just i made the stupidest decision in my life it was, it was horrible but um, my kids got a great education for free. Um, and uh, I helped the program to go FBS. And uh, we watched the team win its first conference championship. After we won the first conference championship was, uh, I think, the first year they ever lim uh, limited enrollment at Liberty because so many kids started to enroll there. And then we went to the playoffs in 2014 and beat JMU uh, in the first round. And that was the first year they ever raised the academic standard at Liberty. And so Dr. Falwell's uh, vision of reaching the world for Christ, I know had to be coming true because the two things that he said were going to happen was happening. So I thought, here I am. I'm doing exactly what God wants me to do. It's not, I, it wasn't full of glory. I'm down in a basement. Sometimes I didn't even see the sun all day because uh, we didn't have no windows. But uh, it was my calling and my opportunity to do what I needed to do to help reach the world for Christ. Um, unfortunately, uh, I, I, I got to say this carefully because I don't want to sound bitter but I was promised that I would never get fired. And I did. Uh, yeah. yeah. And it wasn't, it wasn't handled very well. Yeah. Uh, I got two months severance and they announced I was a re retiring. And I'm like, I didn't say I was retiring. Uh, it, 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 it was, it was, it was, it was, it was unfair. But uh, if I stayed bitter, and uh, it wasn't going to help me none. And after a while, I decided that I wasn't worried about what Liberty could do for me. 
I wanted to know what God wanted me to do for Liberty. Mm. That was my focus. And, uh, so, uh, that was my prayer. Um, and, uh, now I've moved on. I have an incredible job working for Sorenex. I love it. And I wouldn't go back. If, I wouldn't go back. Not that I'm against it. I just love what I do. I love what I do. I get to go visit college and NFL teams. And, uh, I've had plenty of times, uh, with some strength coaches who sat me down and said, I want you to talk to my staff and make sure you tell them about Jesus. Wow. That's yeah. incredible. Yeah. I mean, we're talking ACC schools. Wow. And yeah. Yeah. So it's been an incredible opportunity for me to share my faith. I take, I take the coaches out for uh, lunch and I'll ask them, Hey, do you mind if I lead us in a word of prayer? Amen. Oh yeah. You know, uh, they may ask me about my faith, may not. Uh, I've had one week. I don't know what was going on that week, but I had uh, a week where every coach asked me about uh, marital issues. And I'm like, well, they're going to bone up on my marital counseling. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's just been an incredible journey and I, I appreciate it so much. Uh, I, I would consider going back to the NFL uh, because I enjoy working with the grown men. Uh, but the college guys, I, I, it would have to be a very a uh, unique situation right for me for me to want to go back wow well coach a couple things stand out to me there you know number one a great tip for everybody who's listening you know if you're out with a coaching staff if you're out with um parents donors whoever it is that you might be taking out to lunch whatever it is it's a great opportunity to just ask people if you can pray over the meal if you can pray for them because you never know what conversation can come from that and yeah. like coach said, maybe it does go in that direction. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe a couple of weeks later, someone calls you up because now they know you're a believer, but it's just a great opportunity to just, who doesn't want to be prayed for, you know? Sure. And so um, that's the first thing that stood out to me. You know, another thing coach that you mentioned when you were walking through um, the, the experience in the NFL and the catered food and the first class seating, and then switching it up to the school bus, you know, honestly, as you were talking, it made me think of, how Jesus stepped down from glory, right. To be walk on this earth, right. To, they said he didn't have a place to lay his head. He wasn't accepted in his own hometown, right. His own <laughs> siblings didn't believe in him the whole bit. And then he was crucified for doing nothing wrong. And so, right. you know, there are going to be times in our life where we go through those seasons where it's like, God, this doesn't make sense. Or this is quite humbling right now, but you know, look at all the things that God did with you at that time at Liberty and the lives you've changed. And, um, seeing that vision come to pass. And, um, and so it, it, it's inspiring hearing your story, Coach, because I think we can all take a lot from it. Thank you so much. I yeah. appreciate your encouragement. No, absolutely. Um, and so to that end, you know, I can just tell, like you said, you love what you do now. I can tell you love coaching. The passion is just really exuding off of you. Wh why do you coach? Uh, I was called, uh, I, I, okay. uh, I, I got saved uh, right out of high school. And uh, I think this is going to, this is going to bleed over to another later on. Okay. So but I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to share it right now. Let's go. Let's uh, do it. Okay. My father, uh, my father was a bad guy. I, he had six arrests and uh, he got saved. And I thought it was, a, I thought this Jesus was a crutch. Cause I never went to church ever in my life. I didn't know anything about the spiritual life. And uh, I thought this Jesus was just a crutch because I didn't think he was strong enough to get his life straightened out. And then uh, about the time graduation came around, that we were poor. And uh, I heard my mom and dad say they, they had $7 to their name. That afternoon, my dad comes home from work and he has a little Timex watch, blue Timex watch. And he hands it to me. And I was kind of upset about it. I'm like, why'd you buy this for me? I, I want a dinner, you know? I want food. Uh, and he goes, I, just because. And I said, no, why'd you buy this for me? And I wasn't looking for this at all. And he caught me blindsided and said, I got it because I love you. That was... 
a long time ago, 1978. Here I am. It was the first time you ever told me you loved me. And I knew Jesus was real. And when I knew he was real, I wanted him in my life. Within a couple of weeks, we were in a Wednesday night prayer meeting. And they were talking about the rapture. I'd never heard about the rapture. And I stood up in the middle of the sermon and I said, I'm not saved. I want to get saved right now. Everybody was shocked because I was a good kid. And the pastor said, I'll talk to you afterwards. That was July 5th, 10.05 p.m. I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. A month later, I finished a four-day bus ride. Of, what was it? Uh, 84 hours to go to school at Liberty to walk on. I didn't know a soul, didn't know anybody out there. I never heard of a Christian school. When they told me about a Christian school, my first question was, was I going to have to wear one of the robes? I thought I was going to a monastery. They said, no. I said, that you may have to wear a tie. I'm like, oh, I can wear a tie. I just don't want to wear a robe. <laughs> uh, but I was, I got the liberty and I loved it there. I was so thankful to be there. I didn't have any money, no way to pay for my education. And they told me I was going to have to pay for it. I'm like, and they're like, maybe your mom and dad can help. I said, man, I'm bad off, but my mom and dad are worse off than I am. They said, what are you going to do about it? I said, I don't know. But I know this, I'm here to stay. And I'll do what I have to do. If it means go to school all day, they go to football practice in the afternoon and work all night and just don't sleep. That's what I'll do. But I'm not leaving. I'm going to make it. And it all worked out. And I loved it. I loved it there. In the transformation in my life, people complained about the rules. Man, I embraced the rules. Man, I need, I need someone to tell me what was right and what was wrong, I didn't know the difference. Whatever felt good or good to me, whatever benefited me was right. And I needed someone to tell me what was right and what was wrong. And I didn't mind it at all. And I flourished as a young man. I, was, I read my Bible every single day, every night. I, I'd see these Christians that were had gone to Christian schools, high schools and stuff, and they just – they were so complacent. And I sat there and I just, they made me sick to my stomach. Uh, just here, you got this incredible opportunity and you're making fun of it. And you're, you don't even understand the opportunities that we have. And uh, it, I ch it changed who I was. I, I, it was really cool because there was no internet. So I could become whoever I wanted to be. So I got there and I said, I'm going to just be whoever I wanted to always be. Well, I didn't know the Bible said that you become a new creature in Christ and I just got saved. And uh, I just decided this is who I was going to be. Nobody knew about the baggage I'd come from. Nobody knew about my family background. Nobody knew about the problems I'd had in the past. I got to become whoever I wanted to be. And it was a really cool opportunity to grow and years later we go back to visit uh, my family and my kids would talk, go to my wife and say man are you sure dad's from this family he's nowhere he's nothing <laughs> like that and she tell him she goes that's why your dad got on that bus because he wanted a change in his life and Christ was that change no question uh, unbelievable what he did in my life. Amen. And I'll be always grateful. Amen, Coach. Thank you for telling that story. Appreciate you sharing and with us. Why this has caught me off guard. 
emotional at the end. No, I appreciate you being real with us and sharing all that. That's, that's phenomenal. That's going to encourage a lot of people. Uh, it's encouraging me for sure. Good. So, so thank you. Um, you know, if you can think back coach, you know, if there's like a, a favorite moment that stands out to you, whether it's in coaching or maybe it's even just being at Liberty. I mean, is there a favorite or a couple favorite moments? Uh, you know, there's so many incredible moments. Uh, I remember uh, when we played Purdue in the 2001 Rose Bowl. And uh, I was uh, the head coach's bodyguard. But <laughs> they had six police officers to be, to be my bodyguard and a zillion around him, you know? So it was kind of weird, you know, but we, we, we just smacked them, uh, Purdue. That was, uh, Drew Brees was on that team. Wow. And, uh, yeah, it was pretty special. And, uh, I remember we were in the end zone, uh, looking up to our fans, celebrating with, you know, just the head coach and myself celebrating with the fans. And I had tears rolling down my face. And I thought to myself, what if this was liberty? Then it would really mean something. You know, people would understand that it meant something bigger. I had no desire, no thought of ever coming back to liberty. Uh, but that moment was the seed that was set for the future when my mentor called me and said, Hey, I'd like to step down. I'd like to be your assistant. I'd like for you to come back and, and coach, be the head strength coach here. Uh, there are, are, you know, when Liberty won its first conference championship was a big deal. Uh, going to the playoffs was a big deal. Beating Baylor was a big deal, but, uh, you know, those, those moments behind the scenes where you're tr trying to get these players to come out of their comfort zone and you see that personal victory, you know, the kid who does, believe it or not, 425 push-ups and a workout, oh, and he had a broken arm and he did it with one arm and he's screaming in the back, won't quit. You really, man, you just go, that's what, that's, that's what I'm trying to instill. That's what I'm trying to create. You have to change the culture. You got to tell, explain to them. I don't care whether that rabbit can climb a tree or not. You're climbing the tree. Find a way. But I can't. I don't care. Find a way. You know, it, it was something I learned when I was lifting. I hit a wall. What do I do? I can't get over that wall. We're going left or right is compromise. I can't compromise. What do you do? You fall on your knees and you beg God, show me how to get through that wall. And God will show you, oh, here's a door right here. Oh, I never saw that door before. <laughs> no, nobody's ever seen that door before. That's incredible. But he reveals those things to you. And that's what I've tried to get. The, I tried to get these players to see and understand. And when you saw that occur in their lives, it was, it was crazy. You know, you, you, you just, it was, it was awesome to see the changed lives uh, of the individuals when you challenged them to come to do things that they just thought that was, you, the, the, what I did was I coached safety. Okay. I, I was just over cautious about safety. All right. I did it on purpose. So when I asked them to do something that was nuts, like, oh, that's, there's no way. I did it on purpose because I wanted them to go and say, shoot, he really cares about my safety. He wouldn't ask me to do this if, I, if, I, if he didn't care. That's and a great he must point. Believe, he must believe that I'm capable of doing it. That's a great point. Yeah. That's a great point, Coach. Um, this thing's jam packed. This thing is jam packed with takeaways. And I'm glad we still got a couple questions left here. Um, <laughs> how do you use your platform that you have in strength and conditioning, being an all time world record holder? How do you use that platform to share your faith? Remember our identity 
is not in what we do. Uh, it's in our relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, I, I did a podcast recently. And the guy said, well, you, you, now that you've set the record, this must be your identity. And I said, not at all. I said, my identity is in my relationship with my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My calling is the bench press. And what most people don't understand is when God calls us to do something, he says to present your body a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto him. That's right. And I don't think most people understand the depths. I don't mean a casual. I don't, he doesn't, I gave up for years doing things like bowling or just tons of stuff because God called me to do this. And if I went bowling, it was going to hurt my arm. Uh, I, I gave it everything I had. And I think that that's important. And um, as we go and, and our calling, because I think that that's what people see. So you, when they see that our identity is not in what we're doing, but in our, our application, but when they see there's a difference, they go, oh, whoa, wait, hey, this guy's different. This guy's for, you guys will come up all the time and go, hey, what's your secret? You know, what, 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 what do you do that's different than what I'm doing? Well, it's simple. I have a relationship with my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that you know, just following the principles of the Bible will allow you to be more successful than you could ever imagine just then, uh, than just doing it the way that no, no, the most people do it. Um, but it, I think it's important that whatever you call to do, do it with all your heart and soul and not to do casually and to make sure that you focus on the relationships with people and not just the accomplishments. Uh, the accomplishments, the, my record will come and go, but the 50 year journey that I was on to get there, no one can ever take that away from me. And that's what transformed my life. The record, uh, you know, it's great, but it doesn't change anything. Uh, you know, and, and for me, it's pretty easy to stay humble because I know I'm really not that good of a bench presser. So it's like, uh, you know, and I don't think of, I don't think of the bench press as some, oh, you know, a crazy great thing. Uh, as an athlete, I know uh, it's it's not that athletic, you know. So I I don't I don't I don't get all gaga over it like I guess most people do, you know. Uh, I like I said, I beg God to let let me be great at something else. But, you know, at one point in time, I was going to do uh, archery. I was a pretty good shot with a bow and arrow. God said, no, no, why don't you do uh, bench press? Bench press. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Coach, what's, but, what's, what's one of the biggest challenges you faced? Um, and how did you overcome that? I think that most people, I, I, I will tell you, let me hold, I, I, this may be a little bit of a tangent. but That's fine, Coach. Most people are so goal oriented and they'll do whatever they can to reach that goal. But the goal is only a target to keep you focused on what you're supposed to be doing. And it's the process. That's the key. It's that day-to-day -day process. It's the transformation that's going to occur in your life. That's where the value is going to come in. That's what's going to really mean a lot to you uh, when it's done and over with. The truth is, and I've, you've heard this from uh, other athletes who may have won a gold medal or whatever, they get up the next morning and they go, that was it. That's it. <laughs> you know, you set the all-time world record and you get up the next day and you go, oh, here, better now. I go to the gym. I go to my gym, powerlifting gym. Two, no, the next day. Was it the next day? The two days later. Nobody even knows I set the record. Nobody congratulates me. It's like it never even happened, you know? And you're just like, this is it? You know? <laughs> you got to be kidding me. And so when people go and make that goal their objective, it's too empty, man. 
There's nothing in it. It's an empty, it's an empty motivation. But if you focus on the journey and doing it the right way, then you learn a lot about yourself and you walk your walk with Christ and who you are as a man. That's the value. In fact, in fact, uh, um, when I got ready to, after I missed it, I, I, after I missed the record 20 times and I knew this was going to be my last attempt. I had one attempt left. I sat there and I said, God, I'm good. I'm content. Whether I make it or don't make it, I'm content. Because I know I've tried as hard as I can try. I can't try any harder. And I did say, now, God, if you got any tips, now's the time to share with me. But, uh, and as soon as I set the record, everybody starts celebrating and yelling, you got the all-time record, you got the all-time record. But in my head, I was so focused on the 50-year journey, I'm trying to convince, to explain to them, no, it's about the 50-year journey. And they're looking at me like I'm from Mars. But I'm like, I was so focused on, at that point in time, that I wasn't even thinking about the fact that it was the all-time record. It was, to me, I was... I'm not, I'm not that, and I'm not that guy who goes and says, oh, "I'm content." I'm not. No way. I'm too competitive. Uh, but uh, that moment in time, I felt like I've done everything I can, and I'm I'm content with walking away from it. And uh, and God, I swear, God reached down and picked up that bar. I swear to you. <laughs> <laughs> it was really, really heavy the first two times I tried it. I mean, it was really heavy. And even the third time was heavy, but I thought, well, at least I'm in position, you know? And uh, God told me to bring out my hands an eighth of an inch. I thought, oh, that's pretty smart. Then he said, try to bring the bar down slightly faster. And I went, okay, listen, <laughs> 1,129 pounds will come down the way it wants to come down. I'll try to bring it down a little faster, but no promises on that one. But it came down and it touched my chest and the judge yelled, press. It shot up so fast that it startled everybody. And it's been probably 10 years since I did a bench press that perfect of technique. It was, it was perfect. Wow. Uh, you know, and I, of all times, it was for the all-time world record. It wasn't like anybody could debate it. Uh, fortunately, the head judge, when I locked it out, he made me hold it there for an extra, you know, second to make sure no questions about it. And uh, when I racked it, I didn't even look to see if it was a good lift. I knew, I knew it was a good lift. And uh, everybody, I mean, tears, you can imagine the tears of the people that were there watching because they'd seen how many times I've failed the process and tried, yep. and tried and tried. And what was really cool was uh, I called my wife and I told her, I set the record and she cried. Uh. And then I was going to be a jerk to my son. My son and I have been the world's strongest father son on the equip bench for a long time, close to 20 years. And I said, I called him. I said, man, I said, Cameron, I said that first attempt, my right hamstring cramped up. The bar went to the left. I couldn't get it back. I said, I missed it bad. And the second one, I didn't get in position and brought it down. I yelled for him to grab it, you know, and it just, it just one of those days. And he goes, Oh, dad, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And I said, yeah, but on the third one, I got it. <laughs> and he's like, oh my gosh. He started crying. And then I called my daughter and uh, she started crying. And I'm like, because they knew how much I had invested my life yeah. in to get to making this happen. And they were happy to see me, you know, all three of them, happy to see me go and say, I'm done. You know, and there's, there's no, I still lift heavy and I still lift but I don't 
uh, I won't compete again. Because it's like, I dreamed since I was a little boy. I wanted to be the best in the world at something. Uh, and I always wanted to be strong. And uh, God gave me that opportunity to stand on that mountaintop where nobody else, nobody else has ever been. And I got to look around for over a month and go, wow, this is really cool. It was something that was between me and God. Uh, wasn't a lot of fanfare about it, but it was it was it, the journey. The all the journey was with God and I, and to get to that point, and uh, I wanted to enjoy it with Him, you know. And uh, it's, it was a really cool experience. I enjoyed it. I appreciate it. But again, the records got broke. But they'll never take away that fifty year journey journey I went through and the transformation that's occurred in my life. Yeah. No one will ever think. Now, now what I want to do is I want to figure out how can I communicate that to the normal person that doesn't lift weights? How can I share the journey so they're interested in hearing about it? Because I think there's some things I learned that would be helpful to them, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. And even what you were just saying, coach, about the journey and how it was with you and God, I mean, those are some of the most meaningful moments in my life. When I stop for a second, I reflect and I say, God, you're with me through that. You know, you're with me through that. And I can just start listing them off. And me and my wife, we even have um, prayer journals now. So we'll even write down like a, a moment that was important to us or a prayer God answered. So we don't forget it because, uh -huh. you know, time goes on and sometimes you forget, but you know, I think that's, um, that's really cool. And I agree with you. Those are some of the most special moments. And, um, and then earlier, you know, when you talked about the process and having to go through trial and error and figuring out different ways to do it and being frustrated and giving it everything you have. And, um, you know, it reminded me of another podcast I listened to with Ken Manny at one point, I'm sure, you know, coach Manny and, yeah. um, and he, he talked about the war of attrition. He's like, if you just hang in there and you just stay in there, you're going to come out on top. He's like, but you can't quit. And, um, and it's all about the journey. So yep. coach, you have been doing this for a long time now. What advice would you give to the coaches in this profession who are listening? How do you build a career on longevity? How do you build a career as a lifter even also on, on longevity? You want to touch on that a little bit? Well, first of all, in lifting, it's about staying injury free. So it's, 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 there's times when I, I would get anxious, you know, my boss with the Seahawks used to tell me all the time, God doesn't want you anxious for anything, bud. And I'm like, Oh gosh, you know, <laughs> and, and, and we, you know, and we get that way, you know, where, where we start to put the goal ahead of the process. And so we start trying to push it a little bit harder than we should uh, because we want that goal so bad. And that's normally when you're going to go and get injured. Uh, I think staying within your zone of training is crucial, but staying determined and competitive, but knowing your abilities is the key to, uh, and consistency. Don't ever miss a workout. Don't ever miss a workout. Uh, those are the keys in lifting in coaching. Uh, it's about developing relationships, continuing education, opening your mind to new ideas, and stop saying, well, this is the way we've always done it. <laughs> you know, there's going to be creative ways. And then, and then being able to discern when something new comes in up is whether or not it's worthy of your time or not. You know, uh, the joke is amongst the older strength coaches is tell me, tell me what you call it. And we'll tell you what we called it 30 years ago. <laughs> 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 well, coach, this, this has been such a pleasure for me to talk to you and hear about your story. And we keep mentioning it, your journey. Um, I've taken so much away from it. I know our listeners were as, will as well. Usually we'll end these episodes with three questions. We call them the fast finishers. And so those three questions are, um, what's your favorite book? What's your favorite Bible verse or story from the Bible? And how do you define success? So first question, um, what's your favorite book? All right. Um, I would say Wild at Heart, Bert Soren. Uh, had me uh, gave it to me to read. I don't read because I fall asleep, so I got it on uh, Audible, and it talks about uh, uh, raising young men 
and how we, I'm really into this, uh, uh, helping young men become men because of that's what I did as a coach. Is I want to take young men and teach them how to be a man. Uh, yep, that's a fantastic book. And for you guys who don't know, that's by John Eldridge. If you're looking for that book, it's called Wild. That's what I couldn't remember who wrote it, but yep, unbelievable book. And it's just so important. I think moms and dads need to read it because grandparents, yes. because they're, you know, I think that uh, we have a grandson who's, he's a little stallion. And I keep telling my son, man, I said, this kid's got a lot of spirit. I said, he's tough. He's tough right now to raise, but this kid's going to be able to go somewhere if you don't break its spirit. And I said, it's, it's going to be hard, but you got to cultivate it, you know? And I think that, I think the church, like they said, is too full of nice guys. Yeah. We need men. Yep. We need men in the church. Yep. Now that's Big right. Time. You know, coach, I gave that book to all my groomsmen in my wedding because I liked it so much as well. I love that book. <laughs> awesome. that's, a, that's a great pick. Um, what about your favorite Bible verse or story from the Bible? All right. Now my favorite Bible story is going to be similar. All right. But Adam and Eve, now I'm going to try to keep this brief. All right. But, uh, this, this is one, one of my presentations I use in recruiting uh, because I tell parents, I'm going to teach your boy how to be a man. Uh, when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, all right, he said, God says to Eve, he said, all women will bear children in agony and pain. And I'm telling you, when my wife gave birth, I thought she was going to die. My son said, Dad, I thought my wife, I, I, you know, I thought she was going to die. And it was so gruesome, so hard. I said, I told you. And yet, physically, I didn't feel a thing. Didn't, didn't hurt me at all. So when God says all women will bear children in agony and pain, the first curse doesn't pertain to me at all. Now, the second curse says, you will toil the earth by the sweat of your brow. And what I realized one day was, if the first curse was to the women, the second curse is to the man. And when mm. it says you'll toil the earth by the sweat of your brow, I don't mean that life's going to be hard. It's going to be full of trial and tribulation. It means if you're going to be a man, you're going to work. Yep. And I tell, I tell my guys, I just, don't you dare come walking in my weight room, thumping your chest and say, I'm a man, I'm a man, because a man works. And I teach my guys, there's going to be times where you're going to work and there's nothing going to be in it for you. You're going to be red shirting. You're not going to be playing and you, we need you to work hard so that you can make this team successful because one day you're going to have a job. You can't stand. You're going to work for a boss. You don't like, and you're going to go and get a paycheck and you're going to think, Oh man, think of all the things I get to do with this paycheck. And you're going to go home and your wife's going to take that paycheck and you ain't getting a penny. Of it. <laughs> I said, that's real life. I said, that's what you're going to be doing as a man. Ain't nothing in it for you. You're just going to learn to work. And if you can't accept that, then don't call yourself a man. And, uh, oh, I, I go into a little bit more elaborate than that. But <laughs> you know what I mean? It, well, that was pretty good, it, Coach. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's powerful, you know. And I never, oh, yeah. I never even thought of it that way until one day I was in the middle of a workout. And I went, oh, yes. my God. That's how I feel um, right now. Yeah, with the way you're explaining it, 100. percent never thought about it like that. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. That's awesome. That is great stuff, Coach. Um, <laughs> last question: How do you define success? Um, you know, I, I said it earlier about when I went in for that last attempt, and I said, "God, whether I'm successful or not, I know I've given it my best," and I think that you have to be honest with yourself and you have to say, am I giving it my truly my best? And if you are, whether you're successful or not, you're going to have to, and you're willing to try, you, you're going to learn something through the failures. I, I could, you know, people of the, of the one success thing I have, I could show you 50 failures. And am I a failure or am I successful? But I, what I did was I learned from the failures and I got up. I didn't stay on the ground. It, it, a failure is uh, 
when you refuse to get back up and try again. That's failure. So success would mean, are you willing to get back up and try again? You know, are you, what's, what's it going to take to discourage you to get you to quit? You know, and I think like Kid Manny said, you stay with it long enough, you're going to find success. Um, whether or not it, you see it in uh, X's and O's or whatever records, you're still going to become a more successful person person because of the quality of hard work that you put into it there's there's value in the hard work there's value in the process and don't ever underestimate uh that that time that you put in energy you put into it just because you didn't win and coach to hear you someone who's set an all-time world record speaking from that perspective that it is about the process I remember even Jim Carrey said one time, he said, I hope everyone's rich and successful and famous and has everything they've ever wanted only to realize that it's not that cool, you know? (laughs) And so for people who have reached the top to say these things about the journey, about the process, it's so important for, I think, for all of us to hear it and understand that and take that to heart. And so um, thank you for sharing your story, coach. Congratulations again uh, on the world record. Um, thank you for everything you've poured back into this profession. Someone who's still coaching in it. Um, I'm just soaking it up, everything you're saying. And I just appreciate all you've done for us. So thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate this time. Uh, you're awesome. And uh, I thought this was, uh, you did an incredible job. Oh, I appreciate it, coach. That means a lot to me coming from you. Um, well, hey, coach, if anybody wants to get in touch with you and talk to you more, um, maybe about something you said or ask you a question uh, about one of your stories, what, how, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Probably uh, email. Uh, my personal email is bgillespie800 at gmail.com. Awesome. Very cool. Um, and then, Coach, we usually end these shows with prayer. Um, we just want to get all our listeners, whether they're driving in the car, or listening on their iPhone, whatever it is, we always welcome them to pray along with us. And so is there anything that we can be praying for you and your family for right now? Oh, uh, um, yes. We're looking at the possibility of our daughter and her husband and our granddaughter moving back in with us. Okay. And so, yes, we're, we're excited. We want it really, really bad, but we want it only if it's the right situation for them. Okay. We'd love to support you guys in prayer. So we'll pray right now. Heavenly father, Lord, thank you so much for this opportunity. We had to talk to coach Gillespie and just glean from all his wisdom and his experience. Lord, thank you, Lord God, for um, all that you've done in his life and the ways that you have grown him from a young boy, Lord God, into a man, and all that he's teaching us, Lord God, about what it is to be a man, what it is to coach, what it is to train, and how we can take so many things from these experiences beyond just the experience itself, Lord God. And so I just pray that you'd bless him and his family, Lord God. We just all want to lift him up to you right now, Lord God. We want to lift up him and his family. And as there are these inner workings of his family moving back in with them and um, just all the the intricacies that can go along with that. And whatever your will is, Lord God, we just want to pray your will into that situation, Lord, and just ask that you'd bring forth your good and perfect will and um, that everyone's hearts, Lord God, that are involved would just glorify you, God. And so we just thank you for this time. We love you. And it's in Jesus name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Justin. Thank you for listening to the Built to Last podcast, where we encourage, equip, and empower coaches to live out their core values where they live, work, and wherever they build relationships. Have a blessed day, striving to build lasting impact.